Portland, Seattle is the daddy of all MLS derbies, then this is the upstart son. Louder, brasher, better at getting itself noticed. It has less by way of history, but makes up for that by its ability to generate hysteria. Today, though, it has a big element of jeopardy to it, with both teams at a battle to make the playoffs. El Trafico may be a damaging collision. Welcome to Dignity Health Sports Park, the home of the LA Galaxy, one of the biggest days of this and every season, El Trafico against LAFC. And to kick us off, a major constituent part of the game that's about to unfold, Javier Chicharito Hernandez joins us live from the tunnel down below at pitch level. Javier, I wonder, you've played in many, many big, important late season games of various clubs. How does this one rank? <laughs> same, same as all of them. and. Yeah, like, like you started in the beginning saying that we both are trying to, to, to fight for a spot in, in playoffs, you know, so it's going to be a very special match against a, a very special team and hopefully we can get the three points in front of our fans. Javier, only three goals scored for the LA Galaxy in the month of September. How frustrating has it been for the group? Yeah, I mean, a part of the goals, I mean, these are results, the results. But I think we're uh, making a very good foundation. We're playing much better, so hopefully we can repeat that and, and we can score uh, more goals than them and we can get the three points. As each game goes by, you look a little bit sharper, a little bit more fitter. Where are you in the moment? I'm ready, fit, and 100% ready to, to give my best to help my team. Okay, Javier, good of you to join us so close Thank to you. kick off. Thank you See very you. much See and you. good Bye. luck. Javier Chicharito Hernandez kicking us off in nice fashion. It's nice to have the star of the show join us first. I agree. Up. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a pre show before the main act. Really? Yeah. So aren't you going to ask me a question or no? Uh, I'm sort of pondering whether or not to. I mean, basically, we've got a treat on our hands, but a very different El Trafico to any I think we've ever seen before. First off, it's the most unpredictable rivalry there's ever been. I get it. It started in 2018, and I understand that every single game, something different, something exciting has happened. But yet, John, nobody in Major League Soccer has ever come into this rivalry understanding that both teams are desperate. More often than not, it's been LAFC flying, and LA Galaxy at some point needing some kind kind of result. They've been proactive, a little ugly, making the game very frustrating for Bob Bradley and LAFC in the past. And yet when you look at this rivalry, you tell me another one in Major League Soccer that is delivered in a variety of ways. From the first game this ever happened, the Stars delivered, Zlatan made his entrance, and then he continued to deliver with some key moments in scoring a hat trick in some big ones. Carlos Vela has been there. Yet even without those guys, the game's delivered. No rivalry in Major League Soccer has ever delivered at this level, and yet you're going to ask me right now, what do I expect tonight? I don't know. I don't know because both of these teams are desperate to get into the playoffs, but more so desperate to bring some kind of confidence within their group. Could this be the one pragmatic game that we've ever seen in this rivalry? I just don't see it because I don't think either team can win 1-0. Okay, well, if we'd said that these were the standings after 27 games at the start of the season, many of you, I'm sure, would have scoffed. But this is the way it stands at the moment. LA Galaxy in sixth, LAFC three places and five points further back. So presumably you'd rather be in the Galaxy's shoes right now. You would, uh, and especially because LAFC again tonight, they don't have Carlos Vela. LA Galaxy have shown the ability when Chicharito is fit, he's sharp. We just talked with him and how well he's doing. And so if he's scoring goals, yeah, naturally you want to be with the LA Galaxy. The problem is they've only got one win in the last 10 games. And so it's a little indifferent with what Greg Vanny and the, and the side's going through. And yet I think there's bigger questions with LAFC. We saw their midweek performance against the Portland Timbers. And again, it's consistent just giving up results where st statistically you look at it and say, you know what? They've had better chances, and yet in key moments, John, they haven't delivered. You're going to start talking to me about expected goals, aren't you? I am, because the numbers don't lie. But when you look at these, it, it, it's amazing to think that the LAFC, attacking-wise, should have about 10 to 11 more goals, and defending that should have given up 10 or 11 less goals. That's plus 20, 21. So you think about it, that's easily 12, 13 points. And yet when Bob Bradley postgame is talking about whether or not the group has lost confidence, it's a little shocking that they haven't. Came out of the Portland game um, and, and again tried to find a positive tone. Uh, I thought the overall effort against Portland was good, um, but there are still moments in games where we hurt ourselves. And keeping everybody committed, making sure that um, the feeling of... of too many times letting points get away 
uh, isn't getting in the way of the team mentality and the leadership and, and the kind of spirit you need at the end of the year in important games. Um, over and over, we, we challenge and, and ask the players to believe in the football we, that, that we play. And that's not hard to sell that because they see every game, the, the chances that we create. They see every game, the moments where we win balls, create good opportunities. So we try to make sure that they continue to be strong uh, and not get caught up in the wrong moments, in the wrong things, in the wrong ideas. Well, the statistics don't lie. It's three wins in 14 for LAFC, Taylor. Yeah, and the statistics don't lie either with a player like Brian Rodriguez. We saw one of the best goals in Major League Soccer history the last time these two teams met. Eerily similar to Salah's goal for Liverpool today against Manchester City. And yet you really look at the stats, only two goals since coming on loan. It's been a difficult season. They need more from Brian Rodriguez, especially after selling Diego Rossi. He's got to be vertical. He's got to be dynamic, but he's more importantly got to be clinical. What are we missing with him, though? Because he's about to set off on international duty and he's going to play against Brazil and Argentina. So clearly, Oscar Tabares, the veteran coach of Uruguay, sees something that we are not seeing from Brian Rodriguez. Yeah, I think he's not the first player that shows well for the national team and doesn't show well for his club team or vice versa. You've seen players throughout the history do this. He's still a young player. I just think at times he hasn't taken the position within LAFC's attack and more importantly without Carlos Vela by the scruff of the neck and said you know what I want to make this my position I want to be the guy he's always been kind of differential at times in large part because he came here Diego Rossi was that guy but then you look at C C Fuentes and he's been that guy I think 2021 one of the positive things for him is that he has been the guy that's been dynamic he's been vertical but if they can get Brian Rodriguez going then you've got a different LAFC especially with Carlos Vela more importantly coming back in the next 10 to 11 days yeah just getting a glimpse there of number 11 Jose Cifuentes now let's see how he and Rodriguez fit into today's start Eleven in the week, they began with a back four, which has been their normal way of it, and changed to a back three at half time. I think a lot of this is about keeping possession. Farfan off the left of Mario, fall off the right of that, but so much of it is about the wing backs blessing down the right, Edwards down the left. Atuesta comes back. We return midweek. He's so special in breaking the lines. Chris Sostomo comes in. He's fresh legs. He can chase the game. Sofantes has been very dynamic, a vertical threat through the middle of the field at times. But a lot of this is Arango and Rodriguez. Can they play as a partnership in a two? But more importantly, Rodriguez being the vertical threat because Arango's delivered. Now, listen, he's not Diamande in the sense that he's going to blow by you. He's going to be that physical presence. But Bob Bradley said it best, quote, he's a guy you can count on on and off the field. Six goals in 10 games, he's been that. But I think that number could be 12, 13 goals in 10 games if he had Carlos Vela or if he had Brian Rodriguez being a little bit more dynamic. If they can get that vertical threat, this guy could score you 15 plus goals in a regular season easily. Yeah, they certainly need a few more goals from Christian Arango between now and the end of the regular season. A span of seven games starting today here at Dignity Health Sports Park. Now let's transition our thoughts to the LA Galaxy. I said that frightening stat, three wins in 14 for LAFC. It's worse for the Galaxy, three wins in 15. I know it's a little surprising, isn't it? Because when you look at the way this team started, and mainly they're in the playoff race because of how they started. I get it. They lose Chicharito, and a lot of that goes to went to the wayside. What's more surprising to me, though, is the way they're coll they've collapsed since August 1st. The way they're giving up goals, because that is not a, is a sign of what Greg Vanny wanted to bring in. Now I get it. He brought in 17 new players. You're changing the identity of the club and whatnot, and yet there seems to be a little bit of identity crisis because Greg Vanny wants to possess, but he also wants to defend in moments. And this team is more of a counter-attacking team that wants to get out in the open and yet when you look at their game against RSL I don't think anyone wants to argue with me they were the better team absolutely yet they gave up two goals they shouldn't give up and they should have scored two or three goals and so that's been a real issue for LA Galaxy since August 1st it showed midweek against RSL this is a fantastic goal from Chicharito tight spots great cut great turn but then you're giving up a goal a fantastic goal goal of the week but again defending is there panic? Not really. Greg Vanny's pretty confident about his side. I felt like at the end of that game, and it was very clear and evident. And it, for me, it was a it was a big 
moment that was very different than any other moment we've had after any game, win, lose, or draw after any game, where there was a very clear standard, and if anyone didn't meet it, they were, um, the team was holding them accountable, but also in a very positive way. And I, I, again, I can't always explain it in the best terms unless you've been in the locker rooms. And it was just the group felt good about how they played. They were really pissed and disappointed and hurt, and as they should be, about the outcome. But there, you could tell there was a confidence and belief in the performance side of it and what they did. And if you put those performances out and you just execute on some of the moments that you have, you're going to win far more games than you lose over the course of a season. And that's what you have to believe in when, when, you, when you put on the jersey and you go. You know who you are and you play at the standard that is expected individually and collectively. And if you do that, then the question is, do you execute in the box more than the opposition executes in, in the other box? Uh, and then you win games. Well, it would seem that Javier Hernandez, who we heard from at the top of the show, has been one of the more prominent voices in the locker room of late, trying to G up his colleagues and adding what Greg Vanney described to me yesterday after training as a, an edge and an urgency to the group. Yeah, I, listen, any goal scorer will tell you the final piece to come when you get fit and you come back from injury is in the final 18 yards. The goal he scored against RSL tells me he's ready, he's fit, he's sharp, he's there to score goals, but it's more so the leadership. Because when your goal scored, 12 goals in 15 games, it's now asking for accountability, it's now asking for responsibility in all areas of the field, and putting a lot of that pressure on his shoulders, I think we're going to see a different LA Galaxy side tonight, and a lot of that is because that man right now feels like he's at the top of his game. Game coming off that calf injury and yet there have been hints in recent weeks of better moments for the LA Galaxy when Hernandez has had a strike partner Dan Jovalich earlier in the season Ethan Zubak was playing that role I just wonder at what stage we're likely to see Greg Vanny be bold enough to start a game with a front duo I wouldn't surprise me if you see it tonight especially if LAFC have a lead in the second half they want to get at some point Jovalich and Chicharito together and I think it suits them I think it suits him more than anyone because he thrives with his strike partner he's an old-fashioned striker in the sense that he doesn't love being up front by himself he likes players in and around him so then he can take the chances be the fox in the box get on the end of crosses and I think if they can find a way to get Jovalich playing with Chicharito I think that's a different element we saw it early in the year with Zubek and you mentioned that we saw it in the opening game with Miami they won that game because he made that tactical change it would not surprise me at all going into the playoffs if the LA Galaxy are starting with Jovalich and Chicharito up front well, also in that shot we just saw a brief glimpse of Kevin Cabral, who I know you were thinking would be quite a likely candidate to start this game. He's not. Uh, this is the 11, which shows just one change to their last outing, the defeat at Rail Salt Lake in the week. And that is Sebastian Lejet, who's got a lot of miles on the clock this season, stepping down to the bench. And the veteran Victor Vasquez returning. Yep, Depew will play next to Koulibaly at center back. Hemalainen will not bomb forward as often as Araujo will. Araujo's really grown this season in his possession, in those decisions in the final third. But a lot of this is about the midfield. There's still trying to find the right balance with Revelison and Dos Santos and at times you're going to see Dos Santos play as a second 10 next to Vasquez and Revelison sitting as a lone six. They want Revelison being that six. Grancier Alvarez will play more as wingers than as midfielders, but we have them in the midfield in this lineup because they're not vertical players the way Kevin Cabral is. They're more technical. They're more in possession. They're more inverted. And so at times you're going to see five in the midfield, but it's all about the cleverness of Victor Vasquez. And he's got to find a way to get everyone in and around him to think the way he he does and what I mean by that is when he's on the ball you've got to play vertical you've got to play as a threat going the other way that's where Toronto really thrived when he came in because everyone around him knew when he's on the ball we don't need to come short we need to play in behind Dos Santos can fill in in possession but you've got to get someone in and around Chicharito to take defenders away from him otherwise this could be a long night for LA Galaxy in the attack but of course the genuine general Achilles heel has been the number of goals that the Galaxy yes. have conceded this year the fourth worst defense amongst the 27 clubs and I go back to that comment about this identity crisis because a lot of the players on LA Galaxy think they're possession players and Greg Vanny likes that to a certain extent however that leaves you susceptible because if you are only playing laterally 
and you're not playing the other way and threatening the other team, when you turn the ball over, then all of a sudden your front three, your midfield three, so that's six in front of the back four. John, they're out of position. They're not in good spots. You get caught, and that is still a huge concern. I know everyone in the LA Galaxy world wants to disagree with me, but how do you have confidence in this team defensively? This team cannot go into a playoff game right now and win 1-0. That's a huge concern. Neither can LAFC for what it's worth, but the LA Galaxy, more importantly, Greg Vanny would win those games in Toronto 1-0. They'd get a goal and they'd short up defensively. Right now, the LA Galaxy, they just don't have that in their DNA. Yeah. Well, the defensive stat, 44 goals conceded, is the one that really takes the eye when you look at the recent results and the analytics. They show two clean sheets in 20 games. Yeah, and this is what I'm talking about, though. This is simple defending on the back post. It's 2v1. There's absolutely no reason for the attacking player from RSL to get on the end of it. It's another thing about just wanting to defend. Your goalkeeper does a good job, makes the save. One, two, three, four, five players standing flat-footed. Jite, quicker to react, ball ends up in the back of the net. And then you've just got to be better technically. I'm not trying to take away from Brian Rodriguez. Wonderful goal. That is awful defending. And Greg Vanny knew it. He's worked on it week in and week out. If they can shore up those things, they've got a guy that can change the game in Chicharito going the other way. But they need Koulibaly and company to be a little bit better in those critical moments, especially in the defensive third. Yeah, Sega Koulibaly has had some good moments. He's Absolutely, 21. yes. He's got a lot of growth left in him. Yeah. Um, but he's a player that's made an initial favorable impression. But the problem is he doesn't have a reliable, regular partner at center back. I think that's the bigger concern. I also think they're giving up a ton of goals, not necessarily because of their center back partnership, but it's more of a collective identity. But I would agree with you. Koulibaly has been a good signing, a strong one, but they need someone to fix that next to him. And that's why you've seen Araujo turn into a little bit more of a possession player getting forward. But the partner next to him has changed. Depew, Sterez, neither one have grasped that position. Derek Williams is out. He's, I know he's fit training, but he's been in and out of the lineup. They haven't found that partner next to Koulibaly, and I think it has shown with giving up so many goals. So lucky for them, they're up against what at the moment is a pretty anemic LAFC attack. It is, and, and what's more alarming, and, and I think it's a fantastic conversation for talk show radio if people ever wanted to get into it about LAFC, is while everyone talks about the goals they've given up, I think it's more about the goals they haven't scored. Because when you look at the way LAFC has transpired over the last three years in their identity, it's been what? Absolutely killing you and being vertical and playing in behind and scoring 80 plus goals year in and year out. They're missing chances that they have scored in their history with their eyes closed. I get it, they've given up goals their entire history, but those numbers are eerily similar. What's not similar is missing the quality chances that they have missed, and I think that is desperately shown since Carlos Vela over the last 18 months hasn't been the Carlos Vela that we saw in 2019. And of course, we are approaching a tipping point in LAFC's still brief history in that Carlos Vela and Bob Bradley are both out of contract at the end of the season. So there's a chance to either say, we march on down the same road, or to take a very different route into LAFC's future. Yeah, well, I, I understand Carlos Vela, but after 2019, how do you not look at Bob Bradley and say let's let's reward you for an extra year and so I think it's very interesting that both LAFC have looked at Vela and Bob Bradley and said we're going to wait this one out we're going to play to in the end of 2021 I'd be shocked if Carlos Vela is back next year yeah. I really would unless by some miracle he returns and goes on a tear I'm not sure he's going to return Bob Bradley's a bigger one I think he's the one that has set up the identity he's worked great with John Thornton that will be a bigger surprise to me but it's been a huge loss for the LAFC fan base and for their team that Carlos Vela for the last 18 months hasn't been the Carlos Vela that we saw in 18 and 19. Well, there are 650 LAFC supporters in the ground today, and it would be fair to say that when we arrived around about two and a half hours ago, they coincided, arrived at about the same time, rather more noisily than we did. Yeah, they were, and they used a great chant that was very <laughs> simple and one that you and I would love to share with you. Obviously, you can't. The fact that they showed up at 245 here locally tells you a lot about where this rivalry is, but it also tells you where the level of anxiety is because this, in a weird way, for LAFC more so than LA Galaxy could be a result that catapults them into that old identity, that old mentality, Carlos Vela returning and saying, you know what, we're going to make a run in the playoffs because no one really wants to play them.
because on any given night, they can put you on your heels. The only way they do that is Carlos Vela returns and returns at somewhat of a level of 2019. I mean, if LAFC win today, those fans will be celebrating not just that victory, but the fact that they've drawn LA Galaxy deeper into the, the mire of will they, won't they make the playoffs. But conversely, if LAFC lose today, there'll be five points adrift with just six games to play. So are they pretty much done if they lose this game? I think this is a make or break game for LAFC. Now, Bob Bradley wanted to disagree with me when I asked him that, and I get it because as we've seen so many teams go on runs, look at the Portland Timbers as of late, look at the Philadelphia Union. In the flip of the script, anyone in MLS can win four games on the trot. However, however, this team hasn't shown that ability to win four or five games on the trot. And so I think for LAFC, tonight is a bigger game for them because I really do look at this with Minnesota there. I just think they need them. Well, that is a, a fascinating table. And uh, it is one of the focuses today. Another has been the unveiling of a statue in favor of one of the greatest Galaxy players ever, Landon Donovan, who very shortly will join us. But this is what happened an hour or so ago. Statues are just not erected for what athletes do on the field. They represent what an athlete stands for, what that athlete means. And that is so true with Landon. I called Bruce Arena and said, I understand you're not going to be here. Bruce couldn't make it. He said, yeah, what's this whole statue thing? And I said, well, they're putting up a statue for Landon. You should really be here. His comment was, well, he was a statue for most of the summer of 2006 in Germany. <laughs> Which I thought was a little cruel, but, you know, it is what it is. Dan, Chris, the rest of the Galaxy family, uh, I, I'm very aware that something like this is a decision that's made by human beings. There's no stats that get you a statue. Uh, it doesn't work that way. There's no algorithm. It's human beings who are making a decision that will forever impact my life and my family's life. In this sport more than any other, you cannot single-handedly win anything by yourself. It's not basketball where one player can dominate everything. You need a group of people and it's not just 11 guys, it's 18 or 25 who throughout a season make you better. So I'm eternally grateful to all my teammates who helped lift trophies. Well, from speaking to the masses outside Dignity Health Sports Park in the last hour to in the booth now, Landon Donovan, you're the most welcome of visitors. Um, the statue, I have to ask you, when David Beckham's statue was unveiled, he, in jest, partially in jest, suggested that maybe the backside was a bit too big and the nose was a bit too long. So, first up, are you happy with your likeness? Yes, but only because they added a lot more hair. <laughs> so, I was a little worried about that. Then I see myself on that picture. I'm like, God, I'm so bald. Thanks, it's Dad. It's all good, dude. It's fine. You were that way in high school, so nothing's changed for you. In all seriousness, you've had so many great moments, my man. But where does this rank for you? Um, is it weird? When I stepped away, yeah. Now that I haven't played in so long, I actually can appreciate it more. Maybe you can resonate with that, too. I just appreciate all of it more. And it was a really emotional day for me. I was trying to figure out if I was going to really let it sink in, and it really did. It was it was really special. Yeah. When you look back on your time at the Galaxy, obviously four MLS Cups with this club, two elsewhere, uh, what would you pick out as the ultimate high point of your time? I probably, there's probably two. When, when David first came, it was three really bad years, yeah, you remember, very bad years. And then finally in 2011, when we won a championship, I remember standing right over in that corner, the time ran out, and David and I embraced. And it was more relief than it was just pure joy. So that was one, and then the second was getting to go out as a champion in 2014. That was a really special day here, too. Yeah, because I think so many athletes want to go out the right way, and more often than not, you can't. Atlanta, I want to kind of switch, switch the script a little bit, because very often we don't get the opportunity to actually ask you about what you're currently doing. Do you like coaching? I do. Um, the thought of managing egos like yours would have been a disaster when <laughs> I was playing. Impossible, Landon. Impossible. I know, you got to do it every week. Uh, no, but actually, I love having no, a no, real impact. No, no, keep talking about me, though. <laughs> <laughs> I love being able to have an impact on these young yep. men's lives. And it's at the USL level, so a lot of these guys really need help and guidance, either personally or professionally, and I've really enjoyed that. What's been the biggest challenge for you being a coach? I'm, I'm literally going back to the start where it's like, you know, there's no charter flights. You're not staying in nice hotels. I'm picking up cones at training. But it's kind of humbling, and it's grounding. Yep. Yeah. And did you particularly enjoy beating LA Galaxy 2 yesterday? 
I did, but it's always hard to, to beat my old team. So they're going to make up for it tonight by beating LAFC. Um, in terms of future coaching plans, I mean, I think all of us have seen your name linked with Real Salt Lake, but do you have ambitions? Will we see you as a coach in MLS one day, do you think? I'm a little different probably than most coaches. Um, am I ambitious? Yeah, but my ambition is about being with good people, in a good place, with good support, good ownership. Those things matter to me. So if an opportunity like that comes around, I would absolutely do it. Uh, if not, I'm very happy in San Diego. I'm not, you know, they, they are very supportive and I love it. But if there's an opportunity to do that, I'll do it. But I'm not just going to jump at something just for the sake of it. Okay. And obviously we've got World Cup qualifiers coming up. Your thoughts yeah. on this group of three games that the U.S. faces? Uh, very crucial because we still haven't played Mexico. Um, two games at home that would say you have to win, and then you got to go to Panama and, and try to get something. So I think six, seven, nine points, uh, anything less, and, and you're making it hard on yourself. Okay. And one very final thought. Arsenal unveiled a statue of Thierry Henry. He responded by coming out of retirement <laughs> and scoring goals from them again. Are you coming out of retirement for four? It would only time? be the fourth time. Well, I'm sucking in right now. You don't want to see what I really <laughs> look like. So, yeah, it would only be the fourth time, yeah. Everything's relative, Landon. Um, great to see you. You yeah. too. Uh, and we are very much looking forward, A, to this match and also to U.S. Jamaica a little later this week, which is going to be on our air Thursday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern ESPN2. United States against Jamaica is our live offering on Thursday night. So let's have a look at some of the Western Conference highlights and indeed one or two from the East as well. Orlando City with a dramatic 97th minute winner yesterday against DC United. From Orlando Darryl City DK. have been struggling, John, and yet you get DK back, you get Pereira back. All of a sudden I watch out for Oscar Pereira in Orlando City making a late season run into the playoffs and really gaining some confidence and some forward that I'm not sure you really want to play them. What GT has done to Austin begs the question, what if they would have got the number nine position right from the beginning? Dominguez is going to score two goals, but all of this looks more comfortable, more exciting, more fluid, more balanced, because they've got a number nine up front that now allows Fagundes and company to run in and around them. Fantastic win for Josh Wolf and, and Austin at home. Yeah, Damir Krylak did pull one goal back for Rail Salt Lake late in the game. But Austin have got to play several of the candidates for the playoffs, and they could be a potential stumbling block for plenty of sides further up the Western Conference table. Right to Dallas for the visit of Minnesota. Yep, this is a game that VAR played a huge factor in. Unfortunate for the home side. The highlight of the night was the Hall of Fame, where Steve Terundolo, Jaime Moreno, Kevin Payne, and others got into the Hall of Fame. This was the Hall of Fame game. Hollingshead scores a goal, but it was deemed that he used his left hand to bring the ball down, so VAR changes that. And then for Minnesota United, VAR's gonna play a huge factor in this, as Reynoso was deemed to come in studs up, and he's given a red card when it goes back to video review, so Minnesota United will be without Reynoso in their next game. Yeah, that is a significant blow, because that game is against Colorado next weekend. So Reynoso sent off despite the protestations of Will Trapp and there was a chance for a late winner that fell to Jesus Ferreira of FC Dallas. Yeah, just you know, big issues I think in, in FC Dallas land. Many people felt like it was Luchi Gonzalez. I'm not so sure I agree with that. Wild cards in the West. The team that could really shake it up for both LA teams. Vancouver, one defeat in 15. A Brian White hat-trick against the Earthquakes. Yeah, what's amazing is when you look at Brian White and how he was acquired from the New York Red Bulls and then you look at his career and John I'm going to give you a number he's played 4,000 minutes in Major League Soccer he's got 25 goals that's a goal let's go, let's go. every game and a half and when you look at that rate of return for a player at that number that is a fantastic rate of return for Vancouver three goals on the night Vancouver still believes they can be that last place in the Western Conference playoffs now from Saturday into today Sunday and an early kickoff at Children's Mercy Park goals are plenty as SKC got the better of Houston yeah Shallowy gets his 16th goal of the year easily in the MVP conversation from my point of view a lot of it was Sporting Kansas City getting all over them, but then Houston scores a goal here. All of a sudden, it's the 50th minute. You're saying, uh-oh, here we go. But this is a result that Sporting Kansas City and Peter Vermees believe they should win. They got two goals for Johnny Russell. After he signs a new contract, they win 4-2. Big three points at home, chasing the Seattle Sounders in the Western Conference. Yeah, Gaddy Kinder head over heels as he made it 3-1. 
Darwin Quintero also had a, a late say in matters from a Houston perspective, but it wasn't enough to rescue them. Johnny Russell got his second of the game. He's in a rich vein of scoring and assisting form. 4-2 in favour of Sporting Kansas City. Now, Portland have just finished, and Yaroslav Nitschkoda has got his first goal of the season after a long-term injury to see off into Miami. And Seattle and Colorado is live later tonight on ESPN Plus following our game in what is now turning into a thrilling race It's in unbelievable, the West. especially because we just saw it. Portland can't lose right now. No. And we, we were there in Seattle when we saw them turn it around. That result since then, they've won six of seven. And yet tonight is the game where I think a lot of the Western Conference is going to shape up. If LA AFC can get three points on the road. I, I'm telling you, they're going to make a run at that final two spots. If they don't, we may be looking at a playoff race without LAFC in the right. future. I'm bored of this. Stop all these ifs, buts, Me and too. maybes. Who's going to win? I think LAFC is desperate, more desperate than the LA Galaxy, and yet somehow, some way, every single time the LA Galaxy win in this game, I'm taking the LA Galaxy. Okay, right. Join us on ESPN imminently for live coverage of the Galaxy and LAFC. El Trafico could be a damaging collision this year. Thanks for being with us.